Uh, we bring in the host of the Locked On Kings podcast and sports director over at ABC 10 as well. Uh, one to Matthew George. Uh, we're not really sure if Matt's mic works or not, but you're going to be able to hear him just fine in his office. Matt, what's happening, my man? I changed it. Is this good? It, it, no. It'll do. It's, it'll, fine. It's, it's fine. I don't know. You're, 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 you're in your office, buddy. It's okay. I know. I know. We're still working out the kinks here from the ABC 10 studios, but hey, guys. What's going what's on? Up, man? Oh, you know, just killing time. About ready to hop on a flight. Head to Las Vegas. Looking forward to that. Killing Very- uh, Killing time after a, a fun kind of dull, but you know what it is, press conference. So whatever. Anything stand out? A couple things. Monty snuck in at the very beginning, and I know a lot of people caught it. Uh, snuck in the we're, we might not be done yet type line, and I appreciate yeah. that. Um, I, and then I, I, I really liked how open Malik was about the fact that he knows he has to get better defensively, and he shared with us that um, – both Mike Brown and Monty McNair, when they called him and signed him, challenged him to be better defensively. I think Malik is smart enough to recognize that this, this entire team has to be better defensively, not just him, but he seems ready to embrace that challenge. And I think both he and Kevin know that as good as shooters as they both are, it's probably going to be defense that gets one the starting job over the other. So uh, I'm anxious to see how that comes out in training camp and maybe preseason. Yeah, I think it's interesting that uh... – Everyone is calling the people the Kings trade for or draft or or sign in free agency and telling them they have to be better defense, defensively. Uh, so as opposed to going out and getting better defensive players, you're getting players and telling them they need to be better defensively. Um, I'm not sure that that scheme has worked before, uh, <laughs> but I'm here for it. You know, uh, Who do you think, if you were to make a call right now, who's your starting shooting guard next season, Matt? My starter is Kevin, uh, just because I've seen him at least play a little bit of defense. Plus, I've seen him at, be an effective starter on a team that has had um, has had a playoff run and, and has actually won some basketball games. And I'm not trying to discredit Malik Monk for the year that he had last year with the Lakers. That abomination certainly wasn't his fault. I think he actually made the most out of that situation um, that, he, that he could have. But my, my pick right now is Kevin Herter, fully aware that the competition is wide open. And I, I've also mentioned on D'Lo and Casey before that I, I bet if you ask Davion Mitchell, he believes that he's firmly in the mix for that starting two-guard spot. I don't think he'll get it. The Kings are probably looking at him as their primary point or backup point, seeing as how they don't have another one at this point in time. But um, I, I think – Davion thinks that he'll be in that mix too. Terrence Davis probably thinks that he should be in that mix too. So I think it'll be a good competition for that spot. But but Kevin's my guy right now. I'm I'm, I'm team Red Velvet right now. So let me let me f- follow up with a question for for both of you and and Matt, you can answer first. Is there any benefit to Malik Monk being the starter? Kevin Herter coming off the bench, knowing Kevin can play multiple positions he can come in in that two three role depending on what might be needed in that game whereas Malik Monk is pretty much that two right there is there any benefit to that yeah I I think absolutely there is I I think there's a benefit to either places these guys can play I know Kevin addressed the fact that he thinks he can guard one through four I'm a bit skeptical about that but I I appreciate him challenging himself to that and uh, hopefully he can kind of put his actions and put his defense where his mouth is. But no, I, I definitely see value to that too. And I understand this was kind of the Kenny Caraway argument last time I was on. I understand you have this history between Fox and Monk. You have this chemistry, this belief that what they were able to do at Kentucky can carry over here into the NBA in Sacramento. So you want to start them together to give them the maximum opportunity to do that. I, I hear that completely too. I like the fact that that Kevin also gives, Herter also gives the Kings a little bit of security to if at the trade deadline they want to pursue some kind of Harrison Barnes trade, which I'll believe it when I see it type thing because I know how valuable Harrison is and how hard he is to replace. But if you were to go a route where maybe you trade Harrison away for another piece that doesn't play at his position uh, that you think gets you closer to the playoffs next year or, or where you want to go, Kevin Herter can plug into that starting three spot without too many people rolling their eyes or batting their eyelashes at that. So I like the versatility that both of them bring. Yeah, if I was going to look at, like, Herter is, I mean, it, six seven over 6'7", in shoes, um, he's a big shooting guard, and the Kings haven't had good size in the backcourt for a long time. Guys who are, you know, like Tyrese Halliburton, 6'5", but, you know, he weighed like 155 pounds. Um, having a guy who's big and you can, you know, take advantage of the fact that um, 
that you're not undersized at the position. I, I think that lends me to believe that he'll probably start. And then with Monk, he's, you know, a little bit of a microwave. He's a guy who can really heat up off the bench. Um, I think he's a little more creative as a scorer than Herter is, which lends me to believe that he'll come off the bench where he'll have more of an opportunity to be a primary scorer uh, as opposed to with the starting unit. Herter's going to be a floor spacer, a guy that really can light it up. He's got some nice passing skills, and uh, I I think he is more versatile as a defender than Monk is. So I kind of look at a little bit like... um, you know, he's he's not the defender of a Doug Christie, but a little bit like the Doug Christie, Bobby Jackson situation where it, you know, it's a coin flip on who's the better player, but who's a better fit is always going to be the question in the starting lineup. And that's where I would put Herter uh, above Monk at this point. I think if either one of them are your six man, you, you're setting yourself in a good position. Well, Davion is probably going to be the six man, but your six slash seven guy, you're in a, a good position for success with that second unit regardless. So that's what I like about how Monty has bolstered this. I know, James, you talked a lot about Monty's first year uh, going into the first season, his first full season as the general manager of the Kings, the complete lack of rotation that the Sacramento Kings had. Uh, this now feels like Monty's recognizing, okay, I need to surround my players with better starting talent, but I also need to be able to keep things going when my bench is in the game, when De'Aaron's taking a rest, when Sabonis is taking a rest. It can't be a complete drop-off. So that's what I like a lot about these moves too. That's uh, It's nice to talk about a potential starting five where – uh, or, or, or a position battle where everyone involved in the position battle is an actual NBA player. And we're not fighting about someone who's probably going to be out of the league in a year and a half. <laughs> so that's a nice refreshing change here uh, in Sacramento. But the theme of today, kind of inadvertently in some of our discussions, seems to keep going back to defense. Matt and James, you know, brought up earlier, like Kevin Hurd, like it's awesome. Malik Monk is is awesome, and and acknowledge that Kevin Hurd could probably do, or that uh, excuse me, Keegan Murray could probably do some things on the defensive end. But overall. Kings really haven't brought in a defensive player who could really kind of accentuate what Mike Brown wants to do. And the question that I've asked that I'll ask you is who would that defensive player be? Like, who do you think that guy uh, that the Sacramento Kings could go uh, in, in, in try to get whether Harrison is involved or Sean's involved, however you, you want to work this out could come in and okay, that's the defensive player that Mike Brown needs right there. James, you got a list? I, I, I'm racking my brain trying to think of who's still available, who's out there that realistically the Kings could go I mean, out and get. That, that's, the, that's the tough part. There's no one. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Like, that's that's the thing. Like, we we, 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 we outlined this, and, you know, uh, uh, James started a, a, a Royal Rumble earlier by bringing up Ben Simmons' name, which makes perfect sense, especially if you, you know, the, the, the value being really low and the potential upside in that. But when you really kind of pick this apart, it's like, when it really boils down to it, Mike's going to have to get this roster or something really, really close to it to play defense his way. I wonder how much the Kings are banking on. Like Offensively, this squad, is it too much to assume that this squad should be in the top half of the league offensively just with how they're going to play and De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis? I think the expectation, like what we've been told for years, even going back to to Luke Walton's squad, Dave Yeager's squad even, is – The offense is going to be okay. The offense is going to take care of itself. I think De'Aaron has said that multiple times over the last couple seasons. I wonder if the Kings are not necessarily content with, but the idea is, okay, Mike Brown can get this roster to be a middle-of-the-pack defense as opposed to bottom of the barrel. If they just get to middle-of-the-pack with the offense playing at the level they expect it to be, that is more than, or not necessarily more than enough. That is enough to get this team into the playoffs and then go into next off season, maybe trying to further address that defense. Like that's the only route to me that makes sense at this point for you. Obviously you need to have the personnel to execute it, but I wonder if the, the request of Mike Brown is, Hey, just come in and get this team to be decent. Like if this team is decent defensively with a good to hopefully great offense, in the modern NBA, that should be enough to get you there. We know defensive teams, the top two defensive teams ended up making the NBA finals. That's a different conversation. But just 
status quo defense with good to great offense, get us that Mike Brown and we should be where we want to be next season. Yeah, I just think the Kings are so far away from status quo defense. Like they they've got they've got so far to go. And I think defensive schemes and defensive principles and better uh, competition for minutes, all that stuff that can help you. But at at some point, you do have to have a couple of defensive players. And I think Sabonis is a better defender than we give him credit for. He's a solid, solid defensive. I mean, uh, position defender. I think Keegan Murray is going to be league average as far as a defender. Harrison Barnes has to, if he's going to be the starting small forward, he has to get back to who he's been his whole career. Last last season really does feel like an anomaly, but he was like the the sheer numbers are just stunning how bad he was defensively, like bottom 13% in the league defensively. And that just can't happen. If he's going to play 35 minutes a night, he's got to be a league average defender. And if you start piecing that together and you start getting a bunch of league average defenders, then maybe you can be league average uh, if you're all pulling on the same string and the defensive principles are good. But I still think that they need to figure out a way to address uh, the defensive, you know, deficiencies of this roster. And it can't be going out and getting guys that aren't going to play. Like, yeah. you know, cause that's what a lot of times that we've seen It's like, Oh, well we wouldn't got us on white side. It's like, well, yeah, but that dude can't play more than like eight minutes a night. Like what exactly is Hassan Whiteside going to do? That stop- night, it's going to be an adventure too. If you leave him out there. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. What happened in that ninth minute of Hassan Whiteside? Yeah, I mean, it was chaos, right? So, again, like you you need to find defensive players for this roster for Mike Brown's system. Um, but even saying that, I mean, look at what the Warriors did last year. They were first in the league in defensive rating, first, second, wherever you're at, depending on where you're, what numbers you're reading. Um, but they did that with like 34 year old Steph and a broke down Clay and Draymond missing half the season and Looney not being a shot blocker. Like how they were able to do that, I don't know. Uh, the defensive principles that Mike Brown can teach are pretty incredible, but that's also a team that's been together forever and they know how to play together and they know how to cover for each other and stuff like that. Guys, has the ship sailed on any hope of De'Aaron Fox becoming a good defender? Like has that ship sailed or are we just accepting that at no. best he can be fine? I, I'm I'm going to die on that hill. It's just I've I've had to accept that because I still think he has the tools to be. I I mean I guess I'm trying to differentiate between good and fine. Like let let, let me. I don't. I think De'Aaron can be a not bad defender. Like I I I think De'Aaron Fox can be a defender that's not a liability. I think De'Aaron Fox can be a defender in a way that you're not concerned about it. Like oh he he's going to do his job. You know, we brought this up uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, you, you you both brought up potentially being a top, you know, top ten, top fifteen offense, something along those lines. If you keep games close, and you're in it in the last two and a half, three minutes, I think De'Aaron can play defense for. Like, I think De'Aaron can play. We've seen above it above his, exactly above his normal level of defense for two to three minutes or four minutes or however you want to break this down. I think he can do it for a short period of time. So for me, uh, no, that ship has not sailed, but I've also will acknowledge that that's probably a hill that I'll just have to die on. It goes back once. It goes back to the stat that Roland Beach gave me. It's that uh, De'Aaron Fox is like second in the league uh, field goal percentage against, against the top, 30 scores in the league against the top 30 scores. He's number two in the league and, and best defensive field goal percentage against, and he's still a bad defender. That's because <laughs> he let TJ McConnell take him oh. down to the, just score over him at will. It's because it, it's almost like he, he gets up for the big games and then the down, the other games, the other 65 games of the year, um, he it, disengages. Yeah, yeah. So there has to be a switch that's hit and that he stays on. And he's got to figure that out. He's got to play better. And I think, again, having uh, a player like Sabonis who takes so much so much of the offensive pressure off you mm-hmm. because you're playing off of him, he's not playing off of you. 
Um, I think that's going to allow Fox to conserve some energy. There are going to be times where Fox doesn't have to be just like the focal point for the entire 36 minutes he's on the court on the defensive end. And if you can start having better players around him, better guys like Herder and like Monk, that should actually take some of the pressure off of him, you know? I guess if I if I were just to tell you, though, that De'Aaron was, would remain or is going to continue to be next season, let's say he gets off to a good start, which is what we're all asking for, he is that leading scorer that the Kings need him to be, still that fringe all-star that more wins dictate if he makes it versus personal numbers. But I told you his his cap defensively for his career is his cap as the guy in Sacramento is just fine. It's not the, the question is not is that enough for the Kings to be a good team? The question for me is, is that acceptable? Or is or is it okay for the Kings? Do the Kings accept? Do Kings fans accept De'Aaron Fox's best on the defensive end just being a fine defender as the max paid leader of this team? Is that good enough? I, I just I don't know. Well, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm attempting to just answer that. Dame Lillard just got a, a like sixty one million dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Dame's not a defender. Like, yeah, he doesn't know how to spell that word. I don't. Yeah, think. that is not. And I think Dame is also at the point of his career where he just hits you with the, "That's not my job. I'm here to hit a three and wave bye bye." That's what you're paying me $61 million a year over the final two years of, of, of my contract that I just signed this extension to. So, again, again Dame isn't De'Aaron, and, and Dame does enough other stuff to make that acceptable, mm-hmm. I think, for Portland and for Portland fans. De'Aaron has to start doing enough to make being a fine defender acceptable. Yeah. Because as of right now, I don't. He right as of right now, he doesn't for a long enough period of time. He does it for like 20 games and he gets us all excited and really happy, but then he gets hurt or he gets COVID or he didn't do it the first 40 games of the season. Like we need a, a complete season from De'Aaron Fox. And once we get that, yes, I think fine will be will be acceptable. It'll be enough. Yeah, because I mean, I'll even throw like Dame was the first guy that came to my mind, but like Luka Doncic, they just destroyed oh, on the defensive end. I mean, they on him. they isolated him, and he had like 75 possessions against at one point. It was like stunning how they were able to isolate him. And it doesn't matter. He took his team all the way to the Western Conference Finals. I mean, if, if you can lead your team on the offensive end, then it's the, it's the general manager's job to bring in the players that support your weaknesses. You know, we, we know what Fox's strengths are and the Kings haven't even done a good job in the last, you know, five years, six years of maximizing players to play to his strengths. You know, sure. Having Buddy healed, that can shoot the three that plays to his strengths. Um, but if you would have gone out and got the right pieces all around him in the beginning, then we probably wouldn't have this discussion fully. And some of the right pieces are again guys like Mikel Bridges who takes all the stress off he's such a great defender but he's also a 3 and and D guy he he can score he can do a lot of little things um he's never had a guy like that fox has never had a guy like that so when you know you're going out and you're getting Mo Harkless but not the Mo Harkless that played in Portland uh, you know who played alongside a guy like Robert Covington or you know name those defensive minded you know, wings that uh, the Portland teams have always had. That's a problem. You know, again, look at even this year, they went out and got Jeremy Grant and they, they go out and they get uh, Gary Payton and, you know, they've got defensive players to put all around a guy like Dame. And that's how you support a player like him. That's how you support a player like Fox. And the Kings haven't done that yet. I just think a three and D player is such a hot commodity in, in the modern NBA, because I mean, especially for when your your best player is a point guard who is not known for their ability to space the floor. You obviously need to f- surround them with floor spacers, so you go out and get a Kevin Herter and Malik Monk who aren't necessarily known for their defense because those three those those reliable three-point floor space, spacer 
defensive, also impactful players typically command a, a, a high value and are swooped up or, or, or scooped up every offseason if they're available by teams that are ready to contend versus a team like Sacramento, who's just trying to get there before they can even talk about contending. I just think it's a really difficult, and this is not an anti-build around De'Aaron Fox conversation, or it's not intended to be, because I think building around De'Aaron Fox is still very, very possible. I just think it's a very tough position for Monty McNair in the sense that, okay, I I need to surround my guy with someone who can shoot. Malik Monk, Kevin Herter, perfect. 40 plus percent three-point shooters. Keegan Murray, if you want to include his college numbers, 40 plus percent. Sasha Vizinkov, 40 plus percent. Done that. But then now you have to address defense, too. It's almost like I I don't blame Monty for going, okay, we got a defensive-minded head coach. All right, Mike, please help me out here because I don't know who else I could go and get. Yeah, I could even... Take a direction. Sorry, James, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I could even add, too, that one of the problems that you have is during the Fox era, he's been the best player by a long shot. And this is the first time we're seeing where he's playing with a player who can't score like him but who's as good a player as him and Sabonis. And so I think this might be the first time where we're going to see him like potentially max out who he can be as a player. And now you can truly see what you need around him. And I get it why you don't, why you bring in a guy like Harrison Barnes and try to focus on a, a more well rounded player instead of a three and D player. Uh, and, and you're doing that very specifically because the rest of the team isn't good enough. So you keep, you know, sort of doing patchwork moves here to support the the guys like Fox, but you need more guys like Fox. So, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to me that you need your rotation, your top end of the rotation guys to be better. So then that way role players fit in better. And we haven't got to that point yet. And maybe adding Sabonis, maybe Keegan Murray gets to a point where he also becomes one of those, you know, like the, the players who are, holding this whole thing up, you know, their structural pieces. And then you can start putting those other pieces around them that make sense. Because at this point, like, again, a herder and a monk, they make a lot of sense. But you still got to play defense. Someone else has to do that as well. And you don't really have that that sort of functional piece yet. And so, again, I this is it's advanced rot, roster construction that the Kings just haven't mastered yet. Um, and, you know, it looks like they're getting closer, but they're still a piece or two away. Well, James, you brought up the the Golden State Warriors and kind of the, the, that version of, you know, the, 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 the version that just won the NBA Finals, that older version and the fact that they were a top defense in the league. The two teams we saw in the NBA Finals were the two best defenses in the league. And I wonder how much of that is. And I think. I think the Celtics, maybe more than the Warriors, have guys that you look at and goes like, those guys are like defenders. Certainly, Clay Thompson has a history of being one of the great two-way players in the league, and I think he's going to get a lot closer to that next year than he was necessarily this year. How much of that defense, though, Matt, is is the Mike Brown part, is the part where it's we're focusing on a defense. We have a defensive plan, and I feel like I do this a lot, and I don't mean to, and we don't have a guy – or multiple guys here who are going to screw this up. It's the line that the guys were using a lot. I think it was last year about playing on a string. That was a line being uttered by someone in, in that, in that locker room or is someone on that coaching staff where they were talking about playing defense on a string and understanding where everybody is going to be. Could you put together a solid defensive unit without having a great defensive player just by playing in sync with one another and being in the right spots. Well, see, I'm, I'm a firm believer as someone who recognizes the NBA is definitely a player's league and and rightfully so I'm still a firm believer in the significant impact that a head coach can have on a player's ability, even if they're being paid significantly more. Like we know De'Aaron Fox is making way more money than Mike Brown is. And we know that that has influence uh, in, in the modern NBA, but, I think the reality is like Steph Curry said I, when we spoke to him, Kevin John and I spoke to him uh, on Wednesday at, at the Edgewood Golf Tournament. Steph Curry said he made it very clear, be ready to play some defense. He said there's going to be accountability, and, and I think that's what's important. You know, Luke Walton's throwaway line, which was kind of a joke, but it's really pathetic. It was guard for two dribbles, right? 
Yeah. I guarantee you Mike Brown's bar is going to be way freaking higher than guard for two dribbles. And that Kings team was not able to even do the bare minimum that Luke Walton demanded of him, maybe because Luke Walton wasn't really demanding. He was more asking nicely. So I think Mike Brown is going to come in and he's going to demand, yeah, two dribbles better be a bad possession for you. It better be way more than that. It better be 10 to minimum 15 seconds of the shot clock one-on-one solid defending. So I think Mike Brown can have a significant impact on this roster. I think that's one of the major appeals why, I mean, that's probably the major reason why he got the job. But in addition to that, like James has been discussing, it doesn't matter if you don't have the personnel that's willing to execute it. So will Mike Brown get through to De'Aaron Fox? And I'm not saying that Fox isn't open-minded, even DeMontis Sabonis, Malik Monk. I'm not saying these guys are closed-minded. It sounds like they're very open-minded. But can Mike Brown get through to them enough to actually create on-the-floor change? That that seems so easy to say, but so hard in practice. I don't know too many players that I could list off that we've seen completely change the way that they play or pick up on a, on a bad team, especially the best players, pick up on an area that they're deficient at because of the impact of a coach. It just doesn't happen very often, but the Kings are almost relying on it to happen, and I think it can. Hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to think um, further about that, and I'm trying to I'm, I'm I'm trying to prove you wrong, and thinking of an example where a coach came in and changed the way a player does something, and it, I don't, nothing is popping in my head. But if we just sit here in silence for the next ten minutes, I bet I can think of something. Did, well, did, I'll, I'll add this too. Um, I think this is like not to give Luke Walton a pass on some of the things that happened, but this might be the first time the Kings have been in a situation where a coach isn't being asked to play a player to keep his value up to a certain point or he, mm-hmm. you know, so there isn't a buddy healed sitting there that Luke Walton has no choice, but to play because ownership management is asking him to play that player or a guy like Marvin Bagley. Hey, we need to showcase Marvin for 20 games. It's like, well, in those 20 games, you know, I could go five and 15 as a head coach and I'm going to lose because that's what I have to do. And this might be the first time because I'm looking at this roster and I don't see a player that, that Mike Brown has to play to hold value outside of Rashawn Holmes. And that doesn't even matter because Rashawn Holmes is a backup center to an all-star. And so how is that going to work? Sabone is going to play 35, 36 minutes tonight. There's no way you get around that. So, that's the only player that I would say, oh, he's got value. Maybe you're going to have to play him at the four because of that, but even that might be a forcing you into doing something that could work down the road. Um, so I, I think that that does help because most of Walton's like tenure, just like a lot of uh, Dave Yeager's tenure, was balancing out what management wants and what coaches want and not really finding the – the thing in the middle that's what winning wants because winning wants something very specific. And when you're tussling over what a coach wants and what a front office wants, usually it doesn't equate to what winning wants. What does winning want? (laughs) I know we want winning. Uh, I know that much, Um, but I don't know. I don't know what the magic formula is for all of this. Um, or the managing the shooters with the defensive players. Cause if they're not one in the same, I don't know how you manage both of that. And like, we're talking about this team, like we want them to be a top 15 team and a top, a, a top 15 team offensively, you know, a, a upper half of the league offensively and an upper half of the league defensively. That's not a playing team or that's like a top four team. Right. When you look at the teams that are at the top of the league or, you know, at the upper half of those leagues, in both categories, you're talking about probably, you know, eight of the top teams in, in the entire league in either conference. There's going to be some some faults somewhere, probably more on the defensive end. Sometimes I wonder, can this team, can they function enough on, on, on the defense? It goes back to the original defensive line. Don't be awful. Even if you can't be right there at the average point, just don't be terrible and, and like, just claw yourself around that 19 to 20 ranking or whatever so be in the teens if you have to even if it's 18 or 19 but be in games like don't go down 20 give yourself like a legitimate fighting chance not where you're coming back from 20 down 
and there's five minutes left. But where you've been in the game for the final four or five minutes, that's where I feel like, hey, how can I get Davion Mitchell out here to make that stop? Hey, can De'Aaron step up and do something? Hey, can we as a collective unit, it could be 132 to 132 for God's sakes. Just get that one last stop and win 134 to 132. Play defense when it matters the most. And I think a lot of that, Matt, has to do with whether you're going to be able to play team defense or not versus individual defense. You know, it's funny. You said 132 to 132 while I was thinking about the regularity that was the Kings giving up 130 points last season. Like it it became an expectation to where if the Kings had given up 120, we were almost calling that a halfway decent performance. So (laughs) that's where I think it's genuinely – Mm. almost a, a hope game from Monty McNair, but not necessarily. I think it's a belief in Mike Brown that his reputation, his how well he is liked around the NBA, his, his ability as a leader, plus his basketball mind, all of that can combine in Sacramento to just make the Kings not terrible. To your point, like the Damian, like if that has to be the, the Ted Lasso poster above the door, just not terrible. I, I think that's something that the Sacramento Kings under Mike Brown's leadership can rally behind. I, I know Mike Brown's bar is going to be higher than that, but I really think the Kings believe, and I personally believe, that offensively this team is good enough and they've done enough offensively to where if they're just not terrible defensively, that definitely puts them in the play-in conversation. And like Kevin Herter said, there's no reason why they they can't be competing for a playoff spot at that point. If the Kings play above expectations defensively, they, they're they probably a playoff team. If they play just at expectation, which is not terrible, I think they're in the mix. I'll take hmm. being in the mix. I'll take not being terrible. Um, Still being alive. And bar is low, man. Bar, bar is so low, yeah. but this is the... This is the most, I mean, this is this is the best roster they've had in a long time. Just as it stands right now, no matter no matter what happens. Matt, where are you at the, uh, on this? This is this is going to be a this is going to be a topic of discussion until either something is done or it's not, one or the other. What is your preference with Harrison Barnes right now? Like wh- let me rephrase that. What do you think is best for the Sacramento Kings in terms of Harrison Barnes right now? I, I think the best for the Sacramento Kings is Harrison Barnes remaining a Sacramento King. Like I just, I look at the history of the Kings, how difficult it's been for them to fill that position with the exception of, of like the Rudy Gays and Ron Artests of, of, of the last couple decades. Like that has been a wasteland position that Sacramento has struggled to fill. Even when Harrison has been here, they've still struggled to fill that position somehow just with a little depth at that position. Plus like, D'Lo, we've discussed this a lot, both on Locked on Kings and on on D'Lo and KC. Like, find me a trade where you move on from Harrison, you get someone back that plays his position that's equal to better, who's also younger on a better contract. Like, does that player exist? Like, I just, I don't see a realistic scenario where trading Harrison Barnes works unless... You trade Harrison Barnes at this deadline for maybe a win now value piece that gets you over the hump. And Kevin Herter plays well enough on both ends of the floor to where you can plug him at that spot comfortably. I don't know if I, is it a realistic expectation? I'll throw this back at you too. Is it a realistic expectation to ask Kevin Herter to provide a Harrison Barnes level of production as a starting three? Is that way too much to ask you think, or is that, realistic James. Hmm. um I, I mean to answer the the first question i think the kings have to find a way to to move on from harrison barnes now because i don't think it's healthy for either one of them okay. and while i don't think that you can find a player that's better than i mean it's possible you can find a player you that's better than him um i think losing the access to your first round picks um for the next five years was pretty dramatic when it comes to being able to improve that position using Harrison Barnes as a way to go out and get a better small forward that's younger, that's under contract long term. I don't care if the contract's comparable. Like if you're taking on an extra seven to eight million dollars a year or ten million dollars a year, that's okay as long as the player is worth the value of the contract. 
Uh, but the problem that I think the Kings are going to run into is that they're waiting for that magical deal like they were last year mm -hmm. that never show, showed up until it was too late. Mm -hmm. And like I'm not even considering Herter as a small forward at this point. I'm considering him as a player that can eat some minutes at the small forward position, but I'm still wondering, like, how do you walk into the season with Harrison Barnes as your only natural small forward? And you could even make the argument that he's probably a 3-4 or a 4-3 at this point in his career, and you're still going to go, like, there's still a possibility that you could walk into the season with that and not even having, you know, like we've talked about a Martin twin that now they're both gone or, you know, all of these other types of players that could have possibly fit in that position. And now it's kind of too late. So, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. And like, it's, I keep saying this, it's advanced roster construction and Monty's taken like the slow approach to it. I wish that he would have solved one or two of these problems the first year and then one or two the second year, like he did. And then you wouldn't come to this point going into year three, where you're trying to solve problems that weren't taken care of before. And so it, it's just kind of interesting. We'll see how it all plays out. James, are you under the impression that Harrison Barnes is gone at the end of this this season, no matter what, that he would more than likely not resign with Sacramento? Are you under that or that belief, just you personally? One word answer, James. Yes. And that is the end of our program right 